It's a really great honor and privilege for me. I feel really blessed to be a part of it. And this um, very important meeting is going to be in our annual events for in behalf of the IACT ICCA. So I thank uh, Dr. Chalam sir for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to part of this meeting. Uh, as Dr. Sola sir said in his previous talk about the three um, unlucky per person, one is just in the morning, second is after lunch, and third at my stage where there's a maximum hyperglycemic stage is there. And particularly when you ask somebody to calculate, so definitely the hemodynamic calculations will be more difficult in these uh, subsets. So we'll try to make it a little more simpler with the good name of Sisatya uh, Sai so, um, Bhagwan, I just say Sairam to everyone. Now, being cardiac anesthesiologist, you have been well versed with uh, continuous cardiac output catheters, Swangens catheters, where we are doing state of a hemodynamics data, where we do not need to have the, any calculations or any, any uh, summations or deductions, and even uh, nothing has to be done, we just put a catheter, we get all the data. And most of the times, this data is not derived data, they are strictly, once we are entering to the uh, chambers, we are getting the data. Here, in echocardiographies, we need to have a lot of exemptions, a lot of practice, and a um, and lot of way of doing it. So we are going to go ahead with the hemodynamics data, particularly with the echocardiography. Now, when we talk about the volumetric flow calculations, the Doppler assessments, Doppler analysis is very important, and uh, the people who are doing 2D and 3D echocardiography routinely, they must be having some idea and understanding about the physics of the echocardiography. But of course, we don't need so much physics here. But the, the important aspect is very important, particularly the VTI. So the, it is a integrating of a Doppler derived flow velocities over time. That means that the RBCs, the distance traveled by the RBCs from one point to another point, the distance traveled by that RBCs over that particular time is called the velocity time integral. So here, what, what we are looking for is the particularly the TVI or somebody say they say a VTI is a time velocity integral and that represented the cumulative distance that the particular segments of the blood substance traveling to that distance over that period of time and that is measured by pulse wave. Now being a cardiac anesthesiologist and having some ideas about the echo, you know what is pulse wave and continuous wave. So, when we talk about, say, this is the mid long axis view, if we are talking about this, so the RBC is the distance cell, but the RBC is one they enter to the LVOT or the OT wall, and then we are, uh, we are considering that, that particular segments, so the area distance traveled by that RBC over that particular time is called the VTI, and that we measure by the velocity time integrals. But here we need to have a lot of assumptions. First and foremost assumption is that entire ejected stroke volume is traverses to that structures. Like here in, then, here in uh, more disaffected long axis view, some RBC, some blood is passed through the coronary arteries and so, but we consider that the complete, uh, complete amount of the blood is traverses to that particular structures. Second is the Doppler integrations typically assess the blood flow from only a small fraction of the total uh, cross sections area. So when we talk about the complete assessment of the VTI, we are just considering and target of a one wedge part through which the blood is passing. And third, the LVOT and ascending aorta are more circular that we consider. So out of the four areas like LVOT, RBOT, tricuspid and mitral valve, out of the four area, the blood will be passing in the same amount of the cardiac output, but out of all, the LVOT and the acidic gota, we feel that it is the most circular part, so we consider that area to be the important part for considerations. Another important assumption is that the most accurate when the blood flow is laminar and has the same velocities across the entire vessels. Like here in case of the severe tight mitral aortic valve stenosis, or the mitral valve stenosis, there'll be a lot of turbulence and blood velocities where these calculations doesn't fall right in this kind of thing. So when we are expecting to have the, the calculations of cardiac output by the echocardiography, it's very important that the severe AS, that is a critical AS, and the mild, more, moderate plus aortic regurgitations cannot be considered because that doesn't fall into that um, assumptions. So another important thing is, 
when we talk about say the LVOT, we have to take a cross-sectional area to that particular segments. And when we talk about say aortic wall, we have to take a segments at that particular area because that if this cannot be happened that we are taking a uh, the TVI or VTI of LVOT and we take an area of the aortic wall. So when we are measuring a cardiac output of aortic wall, we have to put our cursor of the VTI at that particular area because otherwise again the assumptions will be difficult. So if we begin with an aortic wall, like here this is the mid this is the short axis view where we are seeing the complete aorta which is a maximally opening area at the particularly the, uh, the all the tricuspid leaflet all the leaflets are seeing opening and closing it off and when you see the maximum opening area and that you can correlate well with the surgery and that is it is a mid systolic where we have the maximum opening of the area and that you measure the planimetry of that particular area and along with that if we take the VTI of particular on the left aortic, left, uh, aortic wall and we measure the VTI like we trace the per completely the angle VTI and then we measure the cross, cross uh, the VTI of that particular area. Same way what, here, here in a mid long, mid long axis view if we talk about the LVOT that is a 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 1 centimeters within the aortic wall annulus nearly about the 5 millimeter. Here that we consider the LVOT and then we put it, uh, the cursor over the LVOT and then we measure the what we put a pulse pulse wave cursor that that is called the VTI. So once we have the diameter of the opening either aortic wall or LVOT that is a cross sectional area and second calculation we have the complete tracing of the VTI signals and that what we get the VTI. So how do we calculate? This is the way how we can calculate. This is the formula that is the cross sectional area multiplied by the VTI is considered to be the, the stroke volume and we multiply the stroke volume to the heart rate that we got to get a cardiac output. So say for example here if we are talking about the LVOT we measure the diameter is about 2.6 LVOT VTI is about 80 centimeters, but very important things to remember there should not be any moderate plus a um, moderate plus AR. So it's a, if you put all these parameters in the calculations, we get this is a pi r square. So we can consider d by two. So pi r square multiplied by that is a cross sectional area multiplied by VTI, and what we get is the stroke volume is 96.3, 96 centimeter cube. So once we get this cardiac output, this is very important things where you trace the VTI, even exaggerated tracing of the VTI or just uh, tracing the shorter of VTI, then again will fall in the wrong calculations. So once we get this VTI and multiply by it with the uh, stroke volume, with the multiply by it with the heart rate, we get the cardiac output. Same things can be done with the pulmonary wall. This is the pulmonary wall. Uh, and here exactly the same calculation we can uh, consider that is particularly the cross sectional area of that particular area multiplied by VTI and we get the stroke volume across the pulmonary wall. So here again we can get the QP by QS and then we can get the calculations of QP by QS. So we can have the same calculations for measurement of a cardiac output whether we are talking about the tricuspid, AOT, Pulmon, uh, pulmon, uh, pulmonary or mitral, anywhere we can have the calculations, but the LVOT and aortic wall is considered to be the best. Looking at it's a geometrical things which is looking more uh, circular. Now, like in Swangan's catheter, we have the continuous cardiac output. This is the advanced continuous cardiac output where we have the continuous cardiac output assessments over six meter, uh, uh, over six minute by the modified advanced Swangan's catheter where we will have the continuous cardiac output with the end diastolic volume, with the end systolic volume, everything we can measure same way in a car, in a eco machines but unfortunately with the eco machine if we are having a T probe we cannot have a T probe for a long time. So if you are measuring the T based cardiac output we have a limitation that we cannot have the continuous cardiac output assessments as we have in a Swangan's catheters and other modalities and this is another simpler mod modalities we are utilizing and it has been showing the good data to correlate with the echocardiography and Swangan's catheter. So the problem of CC con continuous uh, cardiac output by this eco machine is we cannot have the long time continuous cardiac output as we measure with our other parameters. Now the cardiac output doesn't give anything. What is normal cardiac for anybody? There is not a real number. Either then can be the adequate cardiac output or inadequate cardiac output. So we need to know the volume status of a patients. Now on echocardiography, we can have the very easily the volume assessment analysis. 
and that we can have this is left ventricle and diastolic volume and these are the few parameter uh, data we can have it like this is a fraction area changes method of measuring the ejection fractions but along with that we can see the left ventricular cavity contractility by that we can say patient is hypovolemic or hypervolemic like the kissing ventricle the kissing ventricle means when the papillary muscles is touching each other we can say the patient is hypervolemic hypovolemic or patient is the severely distended left ventricular short axis cavity then we can say patient is having the hypervolemic but very important things to be remember the severe concentric hypertrophy like the previous case what we have seen with the cardiac cardiomyopathies hypertrophic cardiomyopathy this this rule doesn't imply so to know the volume status we usually measure the ivc diameter and we correlate that with the right atrial pressure so in spontaneously breathing by inspirations leading to an inspiratory reductions of about say 50% diameters of the ivc ivc so this is how we measure the ivc diameter and this is how we put a probe and that that is very easy to measure and this is one of the important parameters in the intensive care settings where you can measure the ivc here in a spontaneously ventilating patient spontaneously breathing patients we look at the diameter at about say 1 cm just at the R, the ivc ra junctions and we take as patient to take a normal breath and then we ask the patient to sneeze we don't have the patients to say take a deep breath or low breath just ask a patient to uh, take a, to uh, to give a sniff effort and with that there are the data which is there that that we first measure the inferior vena cava diameter whether it is a small which is considered less than 1.5 cm if it is normal about 1.5 to 2.5 if it is dilated more than 2.5 cm and then you change the negative change with the negative inspiration ask the patient to sniff see that whether it is collapsing or it is reducing nearly less than 50 or more than 50 or there is no change so if you measure the previous diameters ask patient to sniff and it, it is collapsing then right atrial pressure is nearly about 0 to 5 cm millimeter of mercury if it is normal if it is less than 2.5 but there is no collapsing with the sniffing then patient is having ra pressure is more than 10 to 15 but if it is significantly dilated 2.5 say more than 2.5 cm that then we expect that the cvp pressures or ra pressure would be more than uh, more than 15 so when we take about the hemodynamic hemodynamic uh, calculations we usually add a 10 to the pressures but not necessary that patient will have the 10 sometimes we just add a 5 or 7 then it suffices we don't have to have the pre configured data of the 10 millimeter mercury so that for that we have to see that whether the ivc is small normal size dilated whether it is decreasing by 50 percent or not with the sniffing and then you consider what ra pressure is that once we have ra pressures then there is a bernoulli equations don't worry about this bernoulli equation this is looking low so complicated but we are not going to this complicated area because three things are considered one is the convective accelerations second is flow accelerations and third is viscous now when we talk about say the previous slide of severe aortic stenosis patients in that we can consider that the difference between the proximal this is like the before stenotic lesions to the after stenotic lesion there is a very big jump of the flow so we just the difference between the proximal to distal is so high then we accept these flow accelerations we are putting the cursor at the mid part of the aorta so the frictions of the fluid friction of the blood across the wall of the aorta is again neglected and this is a convective accelerations because of a, we are measuring only the peak velocities so all these things are then they are removed and again this is an assumption so ultimately what we get it is a final the change of a pressure gradient is about the four times of the peak velocities of a distal flow velocities so suppose we are talking about the aortic wall velocities the peak velocity square times 4 is a gradient between the lvot and the post aortic wall so this is a very simpler way of doppler parameters but very important to remember that this is not applicable when the peak velocities the distance peak velocities is less than 3 cent 3 meter per seconds so for having this simplified Bernoulli equations the peak velocities the distance peak velocities should be more than 3 meter per seconds then only it suffices so the simplified Bernoulli equation states that the pressure drop across the stenotic orifice is four times the square of the velocities of high velocities so once we have 
the RAP, that is RA pressures, with the, these Bernoulli equations, then we can measure the different, different datas of having the hemodynamics, which otherwise we measure by simple Swangens catheter. So these parameters we measure of the right side and these parameters what we measure of the left side of the heart. That is the right ventricular systolic pressure, that is the TR velocities. First we are measuring TR vessel velocities, we square it, multiply by 4 plus RA pressure, what we measure, whether it's a 5, 10, 15 or more than 20. Second is that if patient is having the ventricle septal defect, then we have to measure rather than having a TR, we have to measure the ventricle septal de defect, uh, defect across the VSD, the pressure gradients times 4, that is square times 4, that should be deducted from the systolic blood pressures. And same way pulmonary artery, like this is pul pulmonary systolic pressure, this is pulmonary mean pressures and this is pulmonary dilate, uh, diastolic pressure. So this is all the right side, otherwise what we measure to the Swangens catheters and this is LA pressures and LVDP of the left side. So we'll see how we just otherwise measure like once our catheter is in the RA pressures where we are having the RA velocities. Once we have RA velocities, say for example here it is given 2.26 and then the, the peak TR gradient is about 27.7 millimeter mercury and then if we add into these calculations, we are getting the peak systolic pressure is about 37.37 millimeter of mercury. So once we have TR velocities, peak TR velocities times uh, the square, square it times 4 plus the RA pressures that give you your peak systolic pressures, peak is pulmonary systolic pressures. Now, so here again, the modified track, modified uh, bicable view is very good view to measure the TR velocity. So here we can have the TR velocities. You put a cursor, you can put a continuous wave cursor and you can measure the TR velocities. Now, another important aspect, what we can see otherwise is that PVR, with the Swengen's catheter, we measure the transpulmonary gradients by subtracting the mean pressures minus the uh, wage pressures. Here also we can measure the PVR by having the trick. This is very important formula and this formula is very important when we are managing the uh, uh, nearly SN Menger patients or patient with the ASD with the severe pH where the, the, the PVR can be measured by having the TV, uh, the tricuspid regurgitation peak velocities by VTI of RVOT times 10 plus 0.16. So this formula, if you remember this formula will give you the very, very clear cut idea about the what is pulmonary uh, vascular resistance. And it is said that, it is said that if it is less than 0.2, then this patient is having definitely operable conditions. Now after peak systolic pressures, we are moving to the mean pressures. The mean pressures, again, this is a way how we can, this is a deep transgastric view. You turn the probe to the right side, the clockwise, we can have the pulmonary wall. And once we have the pulmonary wall, we can have the patients having the PI. Here, very important thing, like to measure the peak systolic pressure of a pulmonary, we need to have the tricuspid regurgitations. Here, to measure the mean and diastolic pressure, again, we need to have the pulmonary regurgitations. So if you do not have the pulmonary regurgitations, it is very difficult to have these parameters. So to measure the mean pulmonary artery pressures, now once we get the, once we get the, the, the pulmonary regurgitant velocities, the peak, you have to measure the both peak and once you are the cursor, once you are the waveform, the waveform going down and what measured here is the end PI. This is called the peak PI and this is called the end PI when it is suddenly falling down. And you can have the, you can put these parameters into the calculations that 4V squared, if you put a peak plus CVP, you can get the mean pressures. If you put a late into the, into this formula, you can get the diastolic pressures. So now you have the pulmonary systolic pressure, mean pressure, diastolic pressure, like what we get it into the Swangens catheter. So this is a very good view. You can see here very clearly the pulmonary waveform and you can get a pulmonary diastolic. So like here, we can put a pulmonary pressures, here we can put a systolic pressures, mean pressures and diastolic pressures. Now from coming from the right side, let's go to the left side. For the left side, again here, to measure the left atrial pressure, we should have the mitral regurgitations. So without having mitral regurgitations, this formula doesn't suffice us. So once patient has mitral regurgitations and we want to measure the systolic, uh, the left atrial pressure, the systolic blood pressures minus four MR squared. Like here in this case, like if you can see here, this is a mitral regurgitation waveform. This is a peak regurgitant velocities. 
Here, suppose systolic blood pressure is 90, peak MR velocity is 4.4 meter per square, and you put it into the formula, you can get the left atrial pressure is about 13. So here we need to have the systolic blood pressures, peak velocities of mitral regurgitations, you put it in the formulas, and you can get the left atrial pressures. So once you have the left atrial, left atrial pressures, you can correlate very well, whether it is correlating with the pulmonary artery or occlusive pressures, that is what we consider that it is equal to the LA pressures. Now, there are other ways of measuring LA pressures if we do not have the mitral regurgitation. So this is a tissue Doppler analysis. Most of you must be knowing what is a tissue Doppler. What we measure, the, the uh, color Doppler, the blood flow Doppler is the Doppler derived signals, the waveform, the ultrasound beams are reflecting from the moving RBCs. Here the tissue Dopplers, they are reflected from the tissue, that is from the heart and they are the low frequency tissues as compared to the high frequency tissues of the red, red blood cells and what waveform we are getting exactly like what we are getting into the mitral valve inflow velocities. So here it is the E prime, A prime and S prime. S is the systolic and this is, these are the two phase like in, we have seen in the earlier part of uh, Dr. Rajnikant, uh, Dr. Kartikeyan in uh, talk. We have same inflow velocities, we can have the prime of that is called the tissue Doppler velocities that is E prime, A prime and S prime. So once we have this number of a tissue Doppler, we can just have the ratio. This is E of the mitral valve velocities and this is E prime what we measure. We put a cursor either at the lateral mitral annulus or we put it cursor at the medial mitral annulus and we measure this ratio. So when we put a cursor in the lateral mitral annulus and we measure the tissue Dopplers, we get the three wave that is S prime in the systolic phase and in diastolic two waveform that is E prime and A prime. So once we have a ratio of E by E prime, if it is more than 15, then we can say that uh, that is the one thing or if it is less than eight. If your E by E prime is less than eight, by all chances your patient is having the normal PA pressures, normal occlusive pressures, normal LA pressures, normal LVDP, but if the E by E prime is more than 15, this patient is having the high LA pressure or high LVDP pressures. And it has, this has shown that the patients had all cause mortality is very high when their E by E prime is more than 15. So by that way also, if you do not have the SWAN, but if you have the E to E prime, both of measurement, and then by ratio, if it is more than 15, then this patient is having the high LVDP. And in this form also, you can, you can see it is 8.4 against, it is about say 39.7. So this is very high. The all-cause mortality is very high to this, this kind of patients. So another thing is, that's what I was talking is, that you, here you can see that the one very good article published that if patient has clinical systolic functions or diastolic dysfunctions and clinically bad, but if patient has addition to this, E by E prime is more than 15, then I, I, uh, that all cause mortality is high as high as 35 to 40%. Now, if we do not have the mitral regurgitation and we want to measure the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures, just uh, time, take a E by E prime, multiply by 1.3 plus 2, that will give you a rough idea about the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures. So if you do not have a Swankens catheter, still you can measure the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures, but you need to have the mitral inflow velocities E, as well as a tissue Doppler inflow, uh, tissue Doppler or E prime ratio, multiply by 1.3 plus 2, that gives the average nearly that pul uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressures. Another way of say uh, LA pressures measurement that too like if you have the pulmonary venous components like pulmonary venous components is also like in the morning Shiga, uh, Dr. Rajnikan's talk we have seen the pulmonary uh, waveform uh, pulmonary venous waveform they have the two waveform that S and D pulmonary once you put a cursor pulmonary uh, the, the pulmonary the cursor if you put it into the pulmonary vein you will have this pulse wave cursor of two segments one is systolic one is diastolic and then you get a reversal. So out of these two com components, if that S by D ratio is less than 40, suggests high LA, LA pressures. So if you put a cursor on the pulmonary venous and you found that S is 40% smaller than the D, means patient is having the high LA pressures. Now, this is the A reversal that is called the A wave of the pulmonary venous Doppler. And look at it, the amplitude. If the amplitude of the A reversal, A wave, is more than 25, that again suggests 
if you are seeing here it is reaching nearly 25 that again suggests patient is having the high LA pressures. So if we do not have Swangen's catheter but if you put if you do not have the even the tissue doppler on our eco machines you should have the pulmonary venous doppler and this doppler will also having the ratio of SD and the ratio of the, the velocity is if it is more than 25 centimeter per second that suggests this patient is having high LA pressures. So again with the X without all these gadgets we can measure the LA pressures. Now suppose patient is having a sinus rhythm, patient is having the sinus tachycardia or atrial fibrillations then also we can measure the LA pressures. So again this is a formula for sinus rhythm 2 plus 1.2 multiplied by E by A ratio. In sinus tachycardia more than 100 heart rate 1.5 plus 1.5 into A by E prime and in atrial fibrillations because on echocardiography again your all these calculations doesn't fall into the category when patient is having a severe mitral regurgitations as well as patient is having a severe atrial fibrillations with high ventricular rate. So in this case this formula will tell you the nearly exact what is LA pressure. So these are the other calculative parameters which we should consider. Now only two slides. Now that what we discussed about left ventricular and diastolic pressures. Now we'll go to the left ventricle uh, that was about LA pressures. The the uh, left, left ventricle and diastolic pressures. Again, here we need to have the aortic regurgitations. Like in uh, left ventricle pressure, we require to have the mitral regurgitations for measurement of the left ventricle and diastolic pressures. We need to have the aortic regurgitations. So here, suppose there is a aortic regurgitations. We have one uh, deep transgastric view. This is a very good view where we have the very nice alignment of a cursor, and we can measure the aortic regurgitations here. And you can see here. So here you need to have the diastolic blood pressures like in LA pressure we required systolic blood pressures here we need to have the diastolic blood pressures minus 4 into late VI. Late VI means this is exactly where we are talking about. Here you can say there is a completely falling it becomes a straight line of the waveform of the aortic regurgitation we put a cursor here and what velocities we are getting it you put into this formula you get left ventricle and diastolic pressures. So this was all about the left side of the pressures. So to conclude, the good echo images is mandatory if you are going for the hemodynamics data. Without having the good echo, echo, uh, echo images, you cannot exactly put where you are supposed to put your cursor. Second is understanding of a Doppler is mandatory. Like how to align the Doppler, whether you should put the positive wave Doppler, you should put a continuous wave Doppler, that is very important. Again, PA catheter should not be thrown out. Like so many other, uh, so many data are published after the Cornish trial that it is the worst monitoring tool ever possible. Of course, the data are there for the ICU, but in cardiac anesthesia, still I say that there is still some role of the PA catheters because for measurement of continuous cardiac output, continuous PA catheters, because all these echo data parameters will be at that particular moment of a time. That we cannot have the continuous data available with you. But to that, because we have published one paper where we have correlated real, nearly very much with a good confidence interval of the correlation data between the Swangens catheters and the transesophageal echocardiography. So we need to utilize more than one monitor that once we say echo is not that final echo is excellent. Up till now the Swangens catheter data, data considered to be the gold standard for the cardiac output. But a lot of other data are available or the monitor tools are available to measure all the hemodynamics data. But most important thing is you should better have the basic understanding of the monitor you are using for the cardiac output monitoring. Thank you very much for kindly listening to me. If they have, you have any questions. I think that lady who was shouting in between, she didn't trouble me. <laughs> any question from the floor? Question? OK, Dr. Sastri is an excellent, elegant presentation with a master stroke. Thank you very and much. And both speakers are represented very nicely. So after Modi's surgical strikes, this master stroke has become very, <laughs> very widely accepted. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.